I'm going to try to show you a lot about what you can do with machine learning. OK? Let's get started. OK. Uh, some presentations. So my name is Laurent Picard. As you can hear, maybe, or guess, I'm French. Uh, I work for Google. Uh, I joined uh, Google Cloud two years ago. And before that, uh, I was an ebook pioneer. I worked for 17 years in the ebook industry, doing embedded software, hardware, and eventually cloud. Uh, and I'm focusing on cloud technologies today. Uh, machine learning is part of it, and also uh, on Python, uh, the Python language. OK? Uh, I'd like to know a little bit about you. Who is a developer in the audience? Wow, 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 what a crowd. OK, that's really cool. That's why, why I'm doing this job, to meet you. Uh, who is already using machine learning somehow? OK, who is using cloud services? OK, OK, OK. It's getting higher every time. Uh, OK, cool, perfect. Let's get started. So I, I very much like this quotation from Arthur C. Clarke, uh, because even uh, today, when I see something new with machine learning, I really feel magic, magic, right? Uh, but, but you just scratch a little bit. We are developers. We know technology. We scratch a little bit. This is just technology. There's no magic. And my goal today is to show you that even though you don't have expertise in machine learning, or even if you have expertise, you can use existing solutions, or you can build your own tools, OK? So what is machine learning? This is my very basic definition. You have data as input and you want information as output. This is a wrong definition, but this is, in two years, this is my definition as a non-expert, OK? The reality uh, for expert is, is that machine learning is a part of AI, right? Um, and machine learning learns from examples. And deeper than that, deep learning uh, is actually learning from examples, but dealing with neural networks, OK? So, when I will speak about machine learning, I will be in these fields, OK? Uh, most of the time, it's with deep learning. But I'm not an expert, so I just use machine learning, OK? How does it work? So the experts have been trying to mimic the way we think our brain works with synapses and neurons. For that, we are using a lot of examples. And the result is amazing. It's magic. We manage to solve problems, OK? The typical example, if we want to make the difference on pictures between cats and dogs, then we're going to train a neural network. The experts are going to build these layers, provide inputs, saying, OK, this is a cat. I expect the answer to be a cat. This is the training phase. Once they've done that, then you can use the model with new pictures and ask for predictions for results. And here, typically, it will tell you, most probably, this is a dog. And because maybe it has learned that there's a difference between a cat fur and a dog fur, most likely here. OK? Why does it work now? Why is machine learning possible? First of all, we inherit from centuries, decades uh, of science, right? Uh, algorithms for centuries in mathematics, physics, biology, chemistry, everywhere. everywhere. For decades, uh, now we are able to handle big data, where we have databases, we can store a lot of files. And for 10 years, I would say, now we have the technology to complete this set. We have high pow uh, computing power. And with these three items, now this is why machine learning uh, uh, is useful and works well. OK, uh, a, co a consultant tried to draw the landscape of AI and big data. You don't see anything, me neither. This is, this is just to, to show you it's big. Many companies, many developers are working on it. If you want to start somewhere, then my advice is, if you're working with a cloud provider, just have a look at the solutions. Most of the time, the cloud providers uh, have some solutions for you, OK? Um, to give you an idea about how important that is at Google, those are the numbers of projects with a neural network model uh, and unique ones. And as you can see, this is exponential use. And you can see maybe in some applications already the results in Gmail, for instance, when you start to type a sentence, uh, I don't know in Swedish or but in English or French, for sure, I start to type a sentence, and I have a suggestion to end the sentence. And 
in French, or I'm happy, but I'm even happier in English because most of the time the sentence is better than what I, wa I wanted to type. Okay, so I save a lot of time with that. Um, so if we take a step back, as developers, there are three ways we can benefit from machine learning. Of course, the legacy way where you are doing hardcore machine learning. But if you are a developer with no expertise, you can use uh, machine learning uh, existing models. This is uh, going to be the first part for us. And if that's not enough, then there's AutoML techniques that are filling a big gap where you're going to be able to build your own models, still without any expertise. So these two parts is what is called the building blocks, like Lego bricks. You can pick whatever you want, and you can make smarter solutions thanks to that. Okay. So my goal today is to show you as many examples as possible, so to maybe to give you some ideas. Okay. So first with the APIs. Uh, I told you my basic definition. You have input, so input can be text, pictures, videos, even speech. And from that, you get information. And sometimes this information is the input that has been transformed uh, somehow. Okay. You will get the, uh, the slides are public, so you will get the link at the end. Everything is online. Okay. I, I very much like to start with the vision model to show you because uh, I was a student in the 90s, and at the time we were trying to understand what was in a picture, and the method at the time was edge detection. So we were using convolution matrices and detecting edges and trying to guess what was the objects from the edges. It kind of worked with some pictures, but as soon as we would use new pictures, it just failed. It was so much frustrating. Machine learning uh, is the, sh the solution for such problems. So for instance, uh, what I can do, if I give a picture of Paris to a vision model, it will tell me, yeah, this is Paris. No big deal, everybody here could say the same. Uh, by the way, I get the GPS location, can be handy. Um, if I give another picture with still an Eiffel Tower, uh, as someone living in Paris, I would say, yeah, it's an Eiffel Tower, but it's not Paris. The vision model is able to tell me the same. Okay, this is in Las Vegas, actually. Okay. So this time I tried to see the limit of the vision model. So I took another picture from the web, but I changed it quite significantly. I flipped it, I skewed it, I zoomed in and cropped it. And of course the color, I always changed the colors. And for someone living in Paris in one second or a quarter of a second, yeah, I would say this is Paris, but it's not. And the vision model is not fooled. The vision model tells me this is uh, still Las Vegas. So this is one of the rare cases where uh, a machine learning model is doing better than a human. Most of the time, up until today, we are still doing better. Uh, but on some, we are on some case, in some cases, we're on par, and sometimes they do better. OK? Um, so a vision model will describe you the picture with labels. So here, um, all the other examples, I'm a big fan of Tolkien. So they are going to come from the Tolkien universe. This is a picture coming from New Zealand. This is Hobbiton, where the Lord of the Ring movies uh, were shot. OK, so here, uh, the vision model describes me the picture, nature, flower, garden. OK, every, everything's correct. But if it's able to tell you something more precise, like if there are objects or persons in the picture, it will tell you so. By the way, I forgot to tell you, but it's a web API, so you can do a web request, and this is the JSON stream, that this is the response that you get. So here, the vision model is able to tell me that there are men in the picture, tells me that there's a top, there are, there are pens here, and either a ceiling light and a person in the back. Pretty handy. Um, one year ago, it didn't work that well. So this is something very precise that you get, can get out of pictures right now. If there are faces, it will tell you so. Uh, it will give you um, the location of the different um, parts of the, f the face. It will also try to detect emotions. So here, it's telling me that likely this face is angry, and this is Gollum. Gollum is always angry, right? So this is correct. Uh, I'm getting the location of the head in three dimensions can be handy, and, s and getting also the results from f for some generic emotions. OCR, so text detection. So this is now a solved problem, kind of boring, but it works perfectly. This is, 
this has been a field where uh, researchers have, have worked a lot with algorithms, and now with machine learning, it's almost perfect. Uh, no mistake here, so it's a screenshot. So I try to see the limit with uh, some perspective, still 100% per perfect. By the way, it's getting the different blocks. So here, paragraphs, sentences, and the words. So you, you get the different levels. The only limit I saw today is if I create a warping effect, it's making one mistake. It's missing this word here, but that's it. So let's consider it's a solved problem. But now a vision model is able to detect handwriting. So I tried with this example. It's not that obvious to read. I can read it, but I've read the books, so I have a lot more context uh, than the vision model. But still, it works amazingly well. It's able to detect the different blocks. It's making a couple of mistakes. So here, for instance, I can autocorrect one for the Dark Lord on his Dark Throne. Here it's making a mistake. But it's just the beginning, so maybe in a few months or next year, there won't be any mistakes anymore. If there are, there are famous persons or famous entities, which we call web entities, it will tell you so. So to try that, I picked up a very rare picture I had never seen before. It has been used once by a Spanish newspaper. And here it tells me that this picture is about Tolkien. Amazing. Uh, of course, I get the text, but even better for, for a developer, I get a unique identifier for Tolkien. If it was Christopher Tolkien in the picture, then it would, it would be a different ID. Okay? So it's an API. So you can do web requests, but also there are open source client libraries most of the time uh, that you can use in your favorite language. So mine is Python. And as you see, it's the, always the same principle. You need a client, you provide the input, and you call the, features, the feature that you want, face detection, and you can use the result uh, right away. So the cool thing is that you can focus on exploiting the results, right? So those are examples I have carefully selected. So let's do a live demo so that you see I don't cheat, OK? So I this is my first time in Sweden. I arrived yesterday. And if you live here, maybe you will recognize that. So you, ca you can try most of these uh, in a browser. This is what I'm going to do. Okay, so those pictures are unique. I took them from with my phone yesterday. So there's no way it can relate to something existing. Or, okay, let me just refresh the page. Um, it can only maybe try to match up with something existing, but it doesn't, this picture doesn't exist on the web. Okay, so I get some objects. It's able to detect the train with the perspective, and two persons. Great. And the labels that I get, it's about transport, probably a train station. So yeah, so this is very good. Just slightly disappointed. Ideally, it would tell me that this is uh, the Copenhagen train station, right? But maybe next year? OK, let's try another one. So this one. So this one, you have to know it because it's very close. Um, and it's able to, to recognize the location of this place. So I'm still amazed. Uh, it's been working like that greatly for one year. Uh, I'm still amazed. It's able to detect it. Uh, and here, the fun thing is that it's not telling me... Um, ideally, it should tell me that this is the hotel, because that's the biggest place, right? But I, I think it's telling me that there's a restaurant here. The objects that are detected, person, car, bus, person, and a building. So you see, this is amazing. Ideally, it would tell me that there's one building here, a big one, OK? But still, it's able to see that part. And once more, so this is even closer to the place. If you haven't seen it, then maybe you came with an helicopter. So the way, the, the way it's described, it tells me it's a about a sculpture, architecture, it's a monument, great, but it's also able to tell me where the sculpture is. Amazing. And finally, so this one uh, is a picture that I got from the web, but I changed it completely. Uh, as you can see, the, the colors are 
kind of weird. So there, there's not any pixel in common with the original picture. So here it's telling me that most probably this face is jaw very likely uh, this face is jawful, uh, perfect. It's able to detect the tie, the shirt, and the man. Nice. And yeah, one fun thing is I always get that whenever there's a person with a suit and a tie. So a suit, tie, tells me maybe it's a business person. So it's not. But let's check out the web entities. OK, maybe this is Stefan Löfven, OK, uh, from Sweden, maybe the prime minister of Sweden. OK, so I'm not from here, but I can maybe guess, uh, uh, get some insights. OK, so you see this work, uh, this works live, um, and it's pretty cool. Now, uh, the video, you can extrapolate it to video. Uh, it's almost the same, but you have one more dimension, time. OK, so uh, a video model will give you the same insights as a, pitch, uh, um, a vision model, but also will tell you the different sequences. Uh, in the video. Also, it will be able to track the different objects in the sequences. Okay? The easiest is maybe to also show you one example. So this is a video that has been uh, indexed. If you're able to understand what is in your files, then it means you can index them, right? So here, this is a video that has been indexed by the video model. And I get different kinds of labels. Okay? I have some sound here. And it tells me first that there's a spiral galaxy at the beginning. The world is made with tiny Thank you. Uh, later on, wow, there are humans. Cool. Let's try here. OK. So you see. And finally, it seems there is a polar bear here. Yeah. So you see, like pictures, but with time. Cool. OK. So we've seen everything visual uh, with machine learning. Now, text. Of course, this is, this is a big field called NLP, Natural Language Processing. Um, scientists have been working on this field for decades. Of course, this is what we can handle the most easily uh, with a computer, text. It's small, it's easy to manipulate. But once again, this is machine learning that allows us to do better things with better quality on text. So a natural language model will uh, is able to give you the syntax of a sentence. So this is a, a sentence about Tolkien. So first it tells me that this text is in English. OK, no big deal. It's able to give me the type and nature of all the items in the sentence, including the punctuation and the relationships between them. So it can be handy to understand exactly how, how the text is built. One more thing I, I like very much is we have lemmas, so it means so here I know that was is the verb to be in this case. And so it means I can work with the canonical form of some uh, items. The same sentence, like in pictures, um, we can get the entities. So entities are classes. Um, so for instance, in this sentence, there are three different groups uh, with the three colors here. Uh, in red, we have persons. Tolkien is a person, perfect. And if you notice here, I'm getting an ID about Tolkien, and this is the same ID f that than for the picture before, exactly the same. So I can know that we're talking here about the same person in this text than in the picture before. Okay. Likewise, British is mapped to the UK a location, and the three books at the end as are detected as works of art. Perfect. Also if you want to index and classify uh, your different uh, text corpuses, then it will uh, tell you the, the ideal classification. Here it should be classified under books and literature at 97% of uh, confidence. That this is perfect. OK, and also it tries to measure sentiments in the sentences. So to try that, I took two different reviews, a positive one from the New York Times back in the days, when it was released, and a negative one, a bad one from Pauline. She didn't like the book at all. Okay, And so when you give um, blocks of text or sentences, what you get are scores between minus one and plus one, trying to give you a sense of the positiveness uh, of the sentences. And it, in this case, it works well, very well. Uh, 
These sentences are from Pauline's review. Of course, most of the time you will have neutral sentences. And these sentences come from the New York Times re review, with, which was very positive. Okay. Some companies are using that to analyze the customer emails. Uh, I know one company in the UK that is treating in priority negative emails. And it makes sense. Someone who is not happy, maybe you should, you should be very careful. Someone who is happy, it's great, but maybe you can handle the email a few hours later. Okay. Once again, with a client library, very easy. Uh, you create a client, you provide here the review as text, and you can call analyze sentiments, and you have the results right away. Still on text, uh, I will go very fast on this one because I'm sure everybody here, not one exception, has used Google Translate at least once. Who has not? Okay. Uh, so what I can tell you, yeah, so you all know about, about it. It works on text, on HTML. But what I can tell you th is that three years ago, so I was not working with Google. I was just using uh, Google Translate trying to translate from Chinese or Japanese to French or English. It was working OK a few years ago. But suddenly, the results were amazingly good. So all the, all the better for us. And what I learned is that at this time in 2016, Google switched from a purely statistical model to a machine learning model. So it's still about statistics, right? But this time, the machine learning model is handling the statistics by itself. And thanks to that, we have now very, very good translations. And it's learning all the time, because you just have to provide new samples, and it will improve the model. Uh, if you use Google Translate Live today, uh, you get translations. If you see something wrong, you can say, this is a bad translation. When you do that, you are improving the model. You are saying, OK, this is wrong, and the model will learn. Even better, if you provide the right uh, translation, then the model will be uh, perfect uh, in this case. OK. So here, just two lines. I have more comments than anything else. Client, translate, and that's it. OK. So now about speech. So this is um, not new, because I've used uh, speech engines in the past. But like with translation, it didn't work. Uh, many companies have worked on speech analysis, uh, speech uh, transcription. And it kind of worked, but it, wa it was weird. So now with machine learning, this is amazing. It's able to, to solve this problem. It's also it's learning from real samples. And the nice result is that it's robust to noise. And also, if you use that in a professional context, so maybe it will not work as well. For instance, if you work in a hospital, you're going to use a lot of drug names, right? So what you can do is provide a dictionary with the words that you expect more than usual. And it will help the model to provide you with better results. Like before, if you can understand what is in your audio um, files, then it means you can index them, and then you can know exactly the different locations of the words in your audio stream. Okay. Let me give you an example live. Okay. So I'm taking risk here. So okay. I'm going to switch to Swedish. I don't speak Swedish. Okay. But let's try it. So this works real time. Va er temperaturen emelme. It worked, apparently, yeah? So what's nice is that it's real time. So this is a real challenge. It, it works online, right? But this is still real time. And so you can get intermediate results in real time. So it means maybe you can prefetch some results by anticipation. And at the end of the sentences, then you can provide the best results because you know everything and maybe you have prepared it in advance. So this is one of the bricks for an assistant today. Uh, if you're using Alexa, Siri, uh, Google Assistant, or whatever, this is the main brick now. Why do we have assistants? Is because we can talk to them. This is very natural. And the other brick, of course, we saw it before. It's natural language analysis, if we can transform speech to text. 
then you can analyze the text. And the last brick, the third one, is text-to-speech. You can get an answer back. And once again, companies have worked on uh, speech uh, synthesis for decades. Uh, I've worked with one company 20 years ago. They were working on phonemes, half phonemes, but the result is that we, you were hearing a robot, right? Now with machine learning, machine learning is learning from scratch, doesn't have any considerations. Um, and so one technology um, uh, at Google is WaveNet, uh, developed by DeepMind. Maybe you know DeepMind for AlphaGo. They have beaten the Go uh, world champion. Uh, more recently, last week, they have beaten young people uh, who are champions of, at uh, Alf um, StarCraft. So it's called uh, Alpha Star. So they're trying to learn from scratch and, and do cool stuff with machine learning. So there are a few um, research, research papers if, if you want to know more. So what's cool here is that, is that it's better than real time. It's able to generate 20 seconds of speech in, in only one second. So you can go more, more than fast. Uh, just one example. So those are samples. One of them is the real one, and one has been generated. Oops. So this is very human-like. Um, I've tried to see the, the limit. Uh, there's a Swedish model, by the way, I checked. So there's one WaveNet voice, it's a female voice. Um, I c so in English, I'm not a native speaker, so I think it's great. Um, I can tell the difference. But even in French, so I can tell the difference in French, it's very human-like, uh, and the only way I could hear the difference to, make, to be sure that it's generated is by hearing or watching the signals, right? The, the signals are the audio signals are a little bit different, and if you hear them loud, then there's something different than a human voice. But if you hear the, the whole sentence normally, it's amazing. And this is why now we can have assistants that are so pleasant. You talk to them and they answer back. Okay? So we've seen what you can do with existing models. But in some cases, you will not be able to use them because it will not match your needs. So one example, if I give these two pictures to the vision model, I will get the same results. Sky, cloud, because basically those are uh, clouds in the sky, okay? It's all, almost the same results. But if I want to, more, to have more specific results, if I want to know that I have a Cyrus here and an alto cumulus in the, in, in the bottom, then I'm stuck, right? So uh, auto ML technique, techniques are here to fill the gap. And with AutoML, you need to work a little bit. You need to create a data set. You need to provide training data, right? So it can be pictures, text, whatever. And then the process is the following. You work, so you need to work hard, because this is, this is uh, the, the richness that you, you have and that you will provide, and you will build your own private model with that. You have the data set, you can launch a training and auto email training, you don't have to know anything. Most of the time, the first, so you do a training for one hour, and then you realize the results are not that great, and most of the time it's because we are humans and we make mistakes, and there are a few mis mistakes in the data set. So you fix the mistakes, maybe a second iteration, a third one, and then you have a model that you can use. You can train a model uh, exactly like before, a cloud model that will be the state-of-the-art model with your uh, data set. But also now you can train models that we call edge models. And these models, you can export them. You can export them to TensorFlow Lite, so that's a format that you can use on iOS or Android. So it means you can build an app with a model of your own without knowing anything about machine learning. Now, uh, this is something I'm testing, you can even expor export that to TensorFlow.js. So it means you can have a, a model in the browser. So of course you need to download it, but then it works real time and you can, you can get it to work offline. And finally, also if you have very sensitive data, I don't know, uh, you work with uh, the government or whatever, then you can uh, export and have uh, the model work in a container on your own computer. 
Okay. So uh, this is a demo that was done by a teammate of mine in New York, uh, Sarah Rob Robinson, and she has used a few hundred pictures. She labeled them. Okay, this is an alto cumulus and so on. Then, as I said, she launched a first, a first training. She got some precision results, 85%. Uh, she realized that she had a few mistakes, and then she launched uh, a longer uh, training. And, and then she got a, a lot better results, 92%. One tool to be able to understand w the results that you get is the confusion matrix when you are trying to classify pictures. So here we're, go we're doing great with cumulonimbuses. The test uh, samples are, are always detected, but we're pretty bad with alto stratuses. You see, almost half of the time, it's confused with something else. One explanation maybe is that because we don't have many samples of alto stratuses, and even worse, they all look like the same. Okay? So this is where I told you um, the richness that you have is this data set. You have to, to, to create it, and, and this is all you have to, to do. So I tried the model from Sarah, uh, and this is a picture of mine I took in Poland, and there's a cumulus in the picture, and it works perfect. So, uh, Still, I show you picture, picture, but you can do the same with text, pictures, videos. So you can extrapolate everything that you've seen on existing models. Maybe you cannot do everything today, but you will in the future uh, be able to do it uh, by yourself. You can do today custom classification or custom object detection on pictures, custom classification on videos. You can do your own translations if you want. You can do your own text analysis. I don't know, something crazy. I don't have the time, but if I wanted, you know, Tolkien created the elfish, elfish language. If I wanted to analyze elfish, then I could build, uh, actually, a model for that. I hope someone will do it. <laughs> okay, and also, uh, something new, uh, and with, uh, you can, if you have structured data, uh, be, uh, if you have databases, or even a CSV, a CSV has structured data, you can build an AutoML model out of it. It means you can say, okay, those are my input columns, and those are my out output columns. And then you will get the best model possible to make predictions on new, uh, new rows of data. Okay. So I've built a demo to try that out. Okay, so you can get your smartphones and connect them. We're going to try to play all together. So I, I would like to, to detect emotions in the audience. So first, uh, generic emotions. So I'm going to use the Vision API. And then uh, custom emotions. Is anyone sleeping in the audience? Am I boring? Is anyone tired despite the coffee? Is anyone yawning? And is anyone fun? Is anyone sticking the tongue out to me? OK. So I've built this demo. It's a very small demo. It's who has heard about serverless? Oh, nice, nice. Okay, never seen uh, as many people. If you have not, and if there's a session here or at, uh, at another conference, you should have a look at serverless technologies. So here, I have my backend in Python for administration of the demo. I have a, a bucket here. This is a folder in the cloud. You're going to take your smartphones, send a selfie to me. The selfie will call a function. And with this function, I'll, I will use the Vision API or my own private auto ML vision model that I made. I will do some processing on the picture, and you will see the result on your smartphone and also maybe on the screen. OK? So let's connect your phones. This is my demo. I move. OK, move to step one, step one immediately. And you can connect to the demo with this QR code or with the URL at the top, bit.ly slash ml. Yeah? Give you a moment to get connected. And this is serverless technology, so it means it's scalable. So we are going to try that out. Okay, I don't know how many people are going to use it right now. So, of course, it uses the, the camera, so you can try to trigger one of these generic emotions. And... Uh, 
OK。Ah, it's faster. Okay, so here it's able to detect surprise. Okay, it works. So now I'm going to switch to my model. Nobody has done it, right? Also, it's not useful at all. But if you refresh the page, now you can try to trigger new emotions. Are you sleeping? Are you yawning? Or stick out your tongue to me? Okay. It works. It's able to. But oh, I'm cheating because I trained the model with my pictures and my teammates. So, of course, it's able to recognize me. So now let's see the results that we have. Hey, happy people here. Maybe it's wrong. I wouldn't say you're happy here. Maybe some different emotions. Uh, surprise people. Yeah. Uh, so so that was before the the auto ML model. This one. OK, not really surprised, it's uh, in between. No sad people, hungry people, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so when the mustache is with the Swedish colors, it's the auto ML ones. Yeah, everything is in color here. So people with the tongue out, perfect, uh, yeah. People yawning, yeah, it works. And people sleeping. So here, uh, you have one mistake here. So here you're not sleeping, or did you try to sleep? OK, so wake your neighbors. And also, uh, we have people with glasses. You see? Nice. Many glasses. So let me show you the code for that. This is just the function, the Python function that I have deployed. That's it, uh, to be able to know whether the, the, the picture is safe. If we had a zombie here, it would have been detected with that. The zombie is violent, right? Uh, face detection. So. I, as I got all the different items in the face, I was able to add a moustache to everyone. And object localization, thanks to that, I was able to detect the, the glasses. OK? So pretty cool. Let's move on. I have a couple of minutes more. So tools that you can uh, use to know whether how your model is doing are the positives and neg the negatives. There are four cases, OK? I'm going to get fast. You, I will give you time. The slides are online, so you, you will maybe have a look at that. Um, there are two metrics to evaluate the quality or the type, of the results that you're getting, the precision. So with the precisions, you are trying to get the best quality out of your model, so you are minimizing the false positives. And the recall is the opposite. Uh, if you're doing a search engine, you want as many results uh, as, as possible, and so you will focus on the recall. And with the recall, you try to minimize the false negatives. Under the hood, uh, automail techniques. So those are techniques known by the experts. First is transfer learning. With transfer learning, so it's using an ex existing model, exactly like in the first part with the APIs. You provide your data, and so it's going to learn something custom, something specialized out of your data, and will build new layers in the neural network. And then the result is that you have a customized uh, model just for you. Something maybe specific to Google. Uh, before launching the training, we are actually building, we are evaluating with another machine learning model. We are trying to evaluate the best architecture for your data and your model. This is very, very power uh, intensive. So this is why we have dedicated hard hardware called TPU. You all know GPU, but TPU is a tensor processing unit. And we have big racks of TPUs, and especially in this case, they are used. So before tr launching the training, it's trying to fi find the best architecture for you. And finally, uh, when everything is done, it's also automatically fine-tuning the model to find the, the real optimum. So in this case, this one humans would tend to find good optimums, but not the, the, the best ones, OK? If you want to do more ML and become an expert, one of the, the open source libraries is TensorFlow. So I'm not an expert in TensorFlow. And you can install it on your laptop and create neural networks and launch training and make predictions. Eventually, maybe you will use cloud uh, services because uh, 
it might take days to make a training, and if you want to do it in hours, then you can use cloud services. TensorFlow is the, the, the GitHub, uh, the, mo the, the, the most famous, uh, the preferred uh, machine learning repo on GitHub, and, uh, and by far. Okay, time to wrap up. So, three ways. The time dimension, you can use APIs in hours, you can use AutoML in days, and machine learning will take you weeks or more or months or years or decades, like uh, me uh, with ebooks. The difficulty, there's no difficulty with APIs. With AutoML, you just need to create the data set and then you, ne you need to do everything with machine learning. Those are pointers to, or to Google products. This is a comic uh, about machine learning. If you want to have a, a, a big overview of all the terminology in machine learning, and that's it for me. You have the slides in the top right. If you want to send me feedback, you can use uh, the bottom right um, form. So my goal today was to show you many examples. I think uh, I did it. Um, and I hope, ideally, that it gave you uh, some nice idea. Thanks a lot for having me today. <laughs>